on the freezing night of December the 20th, 1944, men of the 82nd Airborne 504 Parachute Infantry Regiment fought head-on with a vicious SS Panzer group that vastly outgunned them. The MG42 is one of the deadliest guns in the history of World War II. You can cut a tree in half with it. This little-known battle, which raged for nearly two days, would prove to be a pivotal turning point in the Second World War. At its end, hundreds would lay dead and injured. Had the Germans held that bridgehead and broken out of the Ardennes, the outcome of World War II could have been completely different. This is the story of just five soldiers from a company of over 100 men. All of them heroes, all of them prepared to pay the ultimate sacrifice. Out of the carnage and destruction, only four of these five men would survive. But their story is similar to all those who took part in the battle. They are the heroes of HQ Company. I'm Bruce Crompton, history fanatic, military antique collector and ex-paratrooper. In Amazing War Stories, you're going to hear about the heroes that history has almost forgotten were it not for the items they left behind. a young boy cycled up to the US Air Base in Cottesmore, England. The kid, called Bill, was delivering a bottle of whiskey to an American paratrooper who had promised him that if he returned with the goods, he would invite him in to meet the troops. The soldier was as good as his word, and the boy, wide-eyed with excitement, got to meet some of the soldiers of HQ Company part of the 82nd 504 Parachute Infantry Regiment. That boy was my father, William Yardley Crompton, and so began a lifelong fascination with the regiment that continues with me today. Unfortunately, my father recently passed away, which is a shame as he would have loved to have heard this story, especially as he probably met some of the people in it. One of my fondest memories is driving around with him in my original Willys Jeep, painted, of course, with the 504's tactical insignia. On the floor of the vehicle, designed specifically to sit just between the seats, is an antique first aid tip. Dad used to keep his sunglasses in it. I love this little box because of its provenance. It came from the rubble of a little known action in the Ardennes during the Battle of the Bulge. But there's something else that excites me every time I hold it. I know an amazing war story about a driver of a Jeep from that very fight. He won a prestigious medal for his heroics that day. Could my medic box have been on his vehicle? David Smith is a former US Marine and an expert on Second World War weaponry and tactics from that era. Hitler's plan, if it had worked, would have pushed the Allies back into the ocean. His plan was to split the Allied forces and make a dash for the coast, then he would have a shot, a long shot, but a shot nonetheless, of pushing the Allies back into the sea. Had they successfully gotten through at Chinot, they could have really broken out into open country and it would have created a problem. We thought we'd already won the war. Nobody thought Hitler could launch an offensive. And you know that we had ULTRA, we understood the enigma, so we had all the German communications. Hitler insisted on radio silence. So when the Battle of the Bulge commenced, it was truly a surprise.
In December 1944, Western Europe was engulfed in the worst winter in over 50 years. Weather conditions were horrendous. Germany was surrounded, and many thought the war would be over by Christmas. But the Nazis had other ideas. Instead of surrendering, Hitler wanted to counterattack. Against his general's wishes, he ordered them to storm the weakest part of the Allied lines in the Ardennes, Belgium. The hills, winding rivers, steep gullies and narrow roads would make a blitzkrieg assault very demanding, especially in winter. The German military high command thought that it had little chance of success. Hitler, however, was convinced it would work. The Allies would never expect such an attack because only a fool would try it. The German operation, which started on the 16th of December, was quickly besieged with problems. The narrow roads and terrible weather meant the attack was behind schedule. Trucks, tanks and other German armoured vehicles got mired on single track roads. Commanders on the ground couldn't get to key objectives in time. Hitler was furious. Speed was the essence of the Blitzkrieg attack. He knew if you gave the enemy a chance to dig in and defend, then the advantage was forever lost. However, the Allies were wrong-footed, and one SS battle group, led by the infamous German commander, Jochen Piper, had made excellent progress. SS Panzer Group leader Jochen Piper was one of the most feared SS commanders. His nickname was Blowtorch Piper. In Russia, whenever you looked out on the steps and they saw smoke in the horizon, they knew another village was burning, and they would say, there's Piper. He had created a bridgehead across the Amberliv River at a small village called Chenur. German High Command felt this location could be key to the success of the attack. Piper was ordered to hold at all costs until he was reinforced and resupplied by the rest of the division. On the way, to deny the Nazis their victory was the 82nd 504 Regiment, which had dispatched two of its battalions to the area. The convoy of American trucks and jeeps snaked through the cold winter hills of the Ardennes. Inside one of those deuce trucks travelled a machine gun platoon from HQ Company. Up front was Lieutenant Howard Kemble, the man in charge of the platoon. Kemble was an enthusiastic guy who came from a deeply religious family in Queens, New York City. Also on board, Sergeant Al Verbach was in charge of four of the eight machine gun squads. He was a tough, battle-hardened man who prior to the war had been a semi-pro baseball player. Private Robert Kinney was a machine gunner in Verbach's unit. He was known as Barefoot Bob and had an intense love of music. He was often found humming tunes which he had composed himself. Trailing at the back of the convoy was the supply and logistics team. Driving one of the jeeps was Sergeant Norman B. Angel. This well right guy was the HQ Company supply sergeant and he knew the machine gun platoon well. Meanwhile, as the convoy made its way back towards Chenur, Nazi Major Wolfgang von Sacken, one of Piper's top officers, was organising a formidable defence. The town was fortified with an interlocking mesh of machine gun nests, 20 mil flat guns, mortars, howitzer cannons and tanks. He'd been told to hold the town at any cost. He was confident that they could vastly outgun any attacking Americans. Sadly for the 504, he would be quickly proven right. 
The first US soldiers to arrive at the scene in the early hours of the 20th of December received information that a huge German force of 125 armoured vehicles had been seen moving towards Chernobyl. The commanding officer, Colonel Rubin Tucker, ordered the 1st Battalion to move forward and immediately assault the town. A platoon from Baker Company was sent forward, but the attack was easily repelled by von Sacken's men and was stopped dead in its tracks. Back in the 504 command post, Tucker, one of the youngest regimental commanders of the war, instructed his officers that the assault must continue that evening. He told them, we will take that town. The problem that the 504 had was there's only one road into Cheneau. And, you know, that's not a large road. And there's fields on either side of that road with a lot of natural obstacles, barbed wire. And, you know, the Germans are basically sitting there waiting for them. They've got artillery, 105s ranged in, machine guns. So, you know, it's almost a suicidal attack because you're, you're getting funneled into this narrow area with somebody who's ready for you. And I believe when the 504th got into it, they realized that they just simply weren't armed well enough for what was coming. That night, three companies from the 1st Battalion prepared themselves for a night assault. Baker and Charlie would move in first and would then be supported by headquarters company. On a frost-covered hill, our heroes readied themselves for battle in the assembly area, a mile from the town. All of them would play, like so many other men that night, pivotal parts in the battle ahead. Sadly, however, many of them would not make it out alive. Machine gun platoon is a vital component of any infantry company. Strategically, their job is to lay down suppressing fire in order for the assaulting troops to be able to move forward without fear of being hit. David Smith has fired heavy machine guns on operations with the US Marines. To be a machine gunner, you have to have nerves of steel because you're exposed. The problem that all machine guns have is when you start firing a belt-fed, high-caliber weapon like that, you're pretty low to the ground. You're kicking up a lot of dust, and that dust exposes your position. And it's not necessarily that easy to jump up with a machine gun and a tripod and your ammo carriers and run to another position. So when you start firing a machine gun, you can attract counter machine gun fire, you can attract mortars, and you can potentially attract artillery fire. The men in the machine gun platoon of HQ Company knew they would be in for a rough ride. A lot would rest on their shoulders if this assault was to be a success. The situation on the evening of the 20th of December 1944 was grim. So far, six men from the 504 had been cut down in the initial probing assault and they had witnessed seven hidden German half-tracks and a number of machine gun nests. The legend you're about to hear is taken entirely from eyewitness testimonies and documents that were written shortly after the events. Everything is true, no matter how extraordinary it sounds. The assault was planned for 1930 that night and would open with a 10-minute artillery barrage to give the men moving forward some cover. As the clock ticked ever closer to H hour, Angel, the supply sergeant, was in the assembly area handing out ammunition and words of support to bolster morale. Machine gunner Private Kinney took a couple of grenades. Lieutenant Kemble looked at his watch. The second hand ticked slowly around the clock face. Finally, it was 7.30. The men waited for the explosions of the guns behind their positions to signal their move forward. But the only noise of artillery came from the Germans. The paratroopers couldn't wait in the holding area anymore. 
With or without artillery support, they had to press on. The orders were given and the 1st Battalion of the 504 moved forward and walked through the gates of hell. Without the American artillery barrage, the German positions were of course still fully manned. As soon as the 504 started to move through the fields, the German defence lines erupted in machine gun fire. The battlegrounds on either side of the road were lit up with flares and tracer fire which silhouetted the advancing paratroopers. The noise would have been incredible as the first wave of the assault moved forward. Initially, progress was slow as the inexperienced troops were understandably nervous of stepping into what was the suicidal maelstrom of crossfire. The seasoned soldiers amongst them tried to encourage them forward, but even they were cowed by the murderous barrage that seemed to come from all directions. The MG42 is a phenomenal machine gun, way ahead of its time for World War II and fired at the rate of 1,200 rounds a minute. This gun had a fearsome reputation. The U.S. Army actually produced a film for U.S. combat troops to look at, trying to convince them that its bark wasn't as bad as its bite. I'll tell you, its bite was worse than its bark. It was a devastating gun. This thing could take down a tree. You could cut a car in half with it. And when the Allied troops heard that gun, it's a very psychological sound. And they knew they had to take out those MG42 machine gun nests. Very quickly, the casualties started mounting as the advancing units of Baker and Charlie companies received the full brunt of the German defense. Things were looking bad for the Americans. With the attack already in danger of stalling, HQ Company was ordered to advance. Lieutenant Kemble and Sergeant Verbrandt moved their men to the left-hand field as instructed. The barren field was incredibly exposed and had very little cover. The ground was frozen rock solid and it was extremely difficult to dig foxholes in order to get any protection. Kemble and Verbrandt knew they had to press on and support C Company ahead of them. Otherwise, none of them would make it. They had covered about 200 yards, which was halfway through the field, when they were spotted by an enemy strong point on the edge of the village. A flat wagon, hidden on the edge of the town, suddenly unleashed its devastating cannons on them. One by one, HQ's advanced machine gun teams were knocked out by the heavy 20 mil shells. The lethal rounds scythed through the field, picking off each machine gun group one at a time. Machine gunners are always a priority target because machine guns suppress the other troops. They inflict a lot of damage, even on soft-skinned vehicles, even on lightly armored vehicles. So they're always a priority target. And when you start firing that machine gun, you have to know that. And you have to lay as much suppressive fire and, and sow confusion in the enemy before they start directing fire towards you. On a machine gun team, there's generally four or five people. You have your main machine gunner, you have an assistant gunner who helps feed the belt in, and then you always have a couple of men who carry the ammunition because depending on your rate of fire, you have to carry a lot of ammunition. I carried two to 3,000 rounds at any time with my machine gun, and honestly, that's not all that much. And uh, you can never carry enough ammo. The Brack knew he had to flank the flat wagon and briefed the squad. Private Kinney and a small team set off in a wide arc while the rest of the battalion engaged the enemy. They would have to be quick, otherwise the remaining exposed machine guns would soon be taken out. Kinney and the men rushed down the flank as quickly as they could, getting closer and closer to the distracted enemy. The last 25 yards, Kinney covered by crawling and he was now right up against gun emplacement. Pulling the P-51 
pins of the grenades, he threw them both into the flat wagon. The SS soldiers inside had no chance. Kemble, seeing the flat gun was now out of action, grabbed a machine gun and rushed forward 50 yards ahead of his platoon. He began to lay down a wall of fire, suppressing the enemy so that his men could start digging in. Kemble was out on his own, and now he too became the centre of German attention in the left field. The German MG42s spat up the earth around him. Several rounds hit his gun, and another went through his tunic. But miraculously, he was unharmed. Once Lieutenant saw his men were safe, he fell back. But not before he had emptied five full boxes of ammunition into the German position. An incredible 1,250 rounds. Campbell's platoon had taken a terrible toll. Five out of his eight machine gun teams had been killed. He told the deputy platoon leader to hold the line while he went back to get more reinforcements. To him, it seemed that HQ and C companies were beginning to get a toehold on the edge of Chinook. If they could press their advantage, the attacking force would be in the edge of the town. On the other side of the road, in the opposite field, Baker Company was also making slow and very bloody progress. They had now made it into the edge of the town, but were beginning to run out of ammunition. So the fighting had started to descend into brutal hand-to-hand -hand combat. They had managed to destroy several flat wagons by using grenades and killing the crews with fighting knives. But the men desperately needed more ammunition if they were to press home their advantage. Incredibly, there is an audio recording that exists from this epic fight. At the command post, there was a journalist trying to make sense of the battle as it unfolded. There's very heavy fighting going, down, going on down there now between the American paratroops and the German SS men. That was German gunfire in the distance. And American guns were flying to them. Also back at the command post was HQ Supply Sergeant Norman Agel. He too was listening to the intense gunfire and realised that the men must be running low on ammo and first aid. Grabbing a jeep, he piled it high with boxes of supplies. Driving as fast as he could down the icy road, he braved any flat and small arms fire to deliver his vital cargo to the troops in the town. The radio recording has the sound of a jeep racing into battle. We'll never know whether it's actually Sergeant Angels, but the odds are that it is him. Here comes a jeep making a rush down into the village of Chenot now. The road down which is travelling is covered by German small arms fire, so they've taken a chance in this lull to nip down to the troops who are still in the village. The jeep has disappeared round the bend in the road and into the mist. We can't see them now, but they seem to be getting through safely. There goes a small arms fire on the jeep as it goes into the village. As Angel raced backwards and forwards into the town, Kemble had arrived at the front line with reinforcements. The well dug in machine gunners of HQ Company were now able to suppress the SS machine gunners. Suddenly, a break in the firefight happened, and Kemble jumped up with a yell of, let's go, you guys. Firing his gun from his hip, he rushed forward into the edge of the town. Now, they had the Germans on the run, but the fight was far from over. Brutal door-to-door -door unarmed combat was suddenly underway throughout the rubble of Chinook. 
At the same time, HQ Company's head of intelligence, Lieutenant McGrath, received orders to send down a squad to find out how the battle was going and round up any captured German soldiers. He selected some hardened men for the job, one of whom was Curtis Aidlock from Red River County, Texas. As the corporal moved down to Chenur, he became separated from his men in the darkness. It wasn't long before he bumped into a ragtag group of soldiers, formed from the remnants of Baker and Charlie companies. Linking up with them, he moved forward to attack the town. Aidlock was actually interviewed by the journalists just after his assault. During the interview, you can still hear the battle continuing to rage in the town. We left our Belvoir carry at approximately 8 o'clock. We were to jump off at 8 o'clock. We moved in and double filed one company on each side with our headquarters split up half on each side of the road. We moved up approximately 300 yards out from their main line of resistance. We got up there. The, they opened fire on us, and so we all had to split and just get in the best way we could. One officer out of our Baker company had two squads, and we went way to the right flank to outflank this 20-millimeter uh, flak wagon that was, had the companies all pinned down in the open field. We got around, and the officer was knocked out. So a bazooka man, he was not a bazooka man, but he grabbed a bazooka and myself, led the 12 or 14 men on around. He knocked out two half tracks and got another one, got a hit on another one. I don't know whether it was knocked out or not. And at the same time, we hit approximately a platoon or maybe a company, you couldn't tell, of Jerry's at this heavy strong point. There we lost quite a few men wounded and we had to pull back and get some more men from the company and their bypassed the strong point and got men on in below it. How has that helped today's fighting? Well, if, it, if those 20 millimeters hadn't have got out of there, there wouldn't have been enough of us left, I don't expect by this time, to do much fighting. As the corporal's interview was occurring, Kemble and his platoon had pushed further into the town. Miraculously, one building appeared to be untouched, the local church. Kemble briefed his men not to fire on the building unless fired upon from it. Earlier in the week, SS Commander Joachim Piper had reportedly ordered over 80 US prisoners of war to be executed near Malmany, just up the road. Kemble knew the Nazi troopers would have rounded up the civilians before the battle, so was fearful of what he was going to find inside. Crashing through the double doors, he found a priest leading a congregation of women, children and elderly in prayer. What happened next is one of the most moving mental images I've come across from the battle. Lieutenant Campbell took off his helmet and despite the fighting continuing around them, knelt down and prayed with the congregation. It was now late in the evening of the 20th. The momentum seemed to have shifted to the Americans. Although the Germans were still putting up a stiff resistance, the paratroopers now felt they had the upper hand. With the men in his platoon resting, and despite the small hour, Kemble decided to check on his men outside. Like every good sergeant, Verbrack insisted on accompanying his lieutenant. Clabbering through the rubble of Chineur, they came to a doorway where a figure crouched in the darkness. Kemble couldn't see the soldier properly and went to check he was all right. Suddenly, a shot rang out and Lieutenant Kemble slumped to the ground. Sergeant Vrabak whipped out his pistol and fired back, killing the man. He turned back to Kemble, who was lying on the ground, making light of the situation. Relieved, Rabak thought the shot wasn't serious, but to his horror, he saw Campbell's tunic turn red in the darkness. He'd been hit in the chest by the German soldier.
shouting out from medic for Brack, cradled his friend. Ironically, a captured German army doctor worked to save Kemble's life. Lying amongst the rubble of Chaneur, Kemble slowly passed away, all the while quipping jokes to put those around him at ease. The German medic was terribly upset, as was everybody present. Of all the people to be killed, Kemble's loss seemed to be the most keenly felt by the people who were there. Rebrack told the men he died like a Christian and a hero. The fighting in Chinur continued for another day and the sergeant, possibly spurred on by the death of his friend, earned a bronze star for rousing superior numbers of enemy in the town. The Germans were thoroughly beaten in Chinur, but it was a close-run thing to start with. Kinney, Angel and Kemble all received silver stars for their heroic actions and many others in both companies received citations. Aidlock, perhaps surprisingly, didn't get official recognition, but he did get promotion. He ended the war as a staff sergeant. Thankfully, they all survived the war and some stayed in touch. The horrors of what they had witnessed would continue to haunt these men. Sergeant Verbat was particularly affected and for many years afterwards sent food and clothing to a young boy's family he had befriended whilst fighting in Holland. The Battle of Chenot is very significant. Had the Germans held that bridgehead and broken out of the Ardennes, the outcome of World War II could have been completely different. At some point, all these men would have passed through RAF Cottesmore. I often think about whether my father had met them. I'm sure he had. Whenever I drive my Jeep, my mind is always drawn back to the men of the 504 and the first aid box I own. It's funny how a single, sometimes innocuous object can lead you to an amazing story of heroism. If you want to find out more about the Battle in Chineur or the men who fought in it, there are several museums you can visit. The US 82nd Airborne still exists today and is based in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, America. They have a great museum there that has an amazing collection of items. A final word from David Smith. We can't let our museums die away because these are symbols of remembrance and they play a really vital role. We have to understand all the freedoms we enjoy today are based off the sacrifices that our forebears made. My hope is that people by listening to this understand that they need to go to these institutions and donate and keep the memories of our heroes alive. In Belgium, there are lots of collections, big and small, on the Battle of the Bulge. One of my favorites is the December 44 Museum which is just up the road from Chineur in the Glaze. Well worth a visit, especially over the summer when the weather is great. A special thanks must go to historian Frank Van Luntren, whose impressive book, Blocking Kampfgroove Piper, really helped us when we researched this story. Please take the time to give this podcast a like or a review, as the more people that do, the more easily it can be found by other listeners. One final thing, a word of thanks to the people, museums and organisations who, free of charge, gave up their time to help me tell this story. This episode of Amazing War Stories was researched, written and produced by Ed Sayer. The executive producer is Paul Wooding and the associate producer is Lois Crompton. Sound design and 3D mastering is by Vaudeville Sound and music is by Extreme Music. Music